Okay, I think we should get going. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Ashbourne, also the EJ you just heard, uh, PQMD's Executive Director, and I want to welcome you on behalf of our entire team, and thank you for taking the time to join us for this PQMD Pillar Talk, ESG and the Sustainability Dialogue Decoded. It is part of a larger series of webinars which the PQMD Community of Practice offers to address major trends, leading thinking, best practices, and provocative issues in global health. For those of you who are not familiar with PQND, we are a global alliance of international NGOs and leading healthcare companies committed to promoting uh, sustainable access to quality medicines, medical devices, and health products and services in humanitarian disasters, populations in crisis for underserved communities around the world. Founded in 1999, our work is guided by five pillars, humanitarian assistance, health system strengthening, disaster response preparedness, guidelines, and knowledge and innovation. Uh, we're also about to add a sixth pillar, which will be cross-cutting on environment and health. So please look uh, in the chat for our website, the community of practice address, and where to find more information about us. So very quickly, I'm going to go over some housekeeping rules. Uh, please type your name in the chat box and let us know your organization. While we request all participants remain muted, we do invite you to use the chat for questions and comments. And this session is being recorded and will be posted on the PQMD's community of practice this week. And we encourage you to share it with your colleagues and partners. So now I have the pleasure uh, of introducing Mark Chataway, who is one of PQMD's advisory council members and who will be our moderator today. Mark is the managing partner at the global communication and policy consultancy firm, Finn Partners, and his portfolio is responsible for public health in Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Mark is an expert in policy analysis and development, opinion research and communications, and many of you already know him as the chair of several of the PQMD Global Health Policy Forums, most recently in Paris this past April. We are absolutely thrilled to have Mark lead this conversation with two extraordinary colleagues who will unpack and translate ESG terminology, ESG metrics, the intention behind them, and what it all means for trends in sustainability. Thank you to all of you, and Mark, over to you. Thanks, CJ, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here, and as you say, we do have two uh, amazing guests. So what we're going to do is we're going to run through a, a discussion about ESG, but we would like your thoughts and questions and comments from the start. As EJ said, put them in the discussion box. If there's something you really feel you can't type out for whatever reason, let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll try and uh, include you. Um, may, maybe it's a story uh, so, so risque that you don't dare type it out, uh, but uh, you, you, can, you can let us know and we'll try and include you. But Comments and questions throughout would be great. We'd, we'd love to hear from, from you. Uh, this is a vast subject, and our challenge is going to be to cover everything we want to cover in the in the time we have. Uh, but to know that we're doing it right, we really need to hear from you. So if there's something that's unclear, tell us. If there's something you want us to expand on, tell us. And if there's a, a, a an experience of your own or a, um, uh, a doubt of your own, then tell us that too. That would be helpful. So I'm, I'm not going to try to summarize ESG uh, because that's what we're going to do uh, over the next 55 minutes or so. Uh, but I thought I'd give you two quotes about ESG. So Sir Ronnie Cohen, who's one of the world's leading venture capitalists, um, says we need impact investing. And, and at the center of that is uh, investing based on environmental, on social, on governance concerns. Because he says for more than 200 years, our existing version of capitalism drove prosperity and lifted billions out of poverty, but it no longer fulfills its promise to deliver widespread economic improvement and social progress. Its negative social and environmental consequences have become so great, we can no longer handle them. That was one of the world's leading venture capitalists. Um, a politician said something quite different. Big banks and corporate activists have colluded to inject woke ideology into the global marketplace, regardless of the financial interests of beneficiaries. So we'll try in this hour to see if we can get to the bottom of 
whether there's an element of truth in both of those points of view or, or whether one's wrong and, 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 and one's right. Uh, and joining us to do that is Veronica Ar Ar Aroyave, who is the Vice President for Corporate Responsibility and Global Philanthropy at Baxter Healthcare, the Executive Director of the Baxter International Foundation. She has a PhD in International Affairs with a focus on disaster response. She ran global health programs at PQMD, uh, and uh, she's uh, a certified corporate responsibility executive uh, from the Notre Dame Mendoza College of Business. So you can't get much more authoritative than that, unless you turn to Paula Luff, uh, who's director of ESG research and engagement at DSC Meridian Capital. And DSC Meridian Capital, lest you think it's some uh, fluffy uh, enterprise, describes itself as an opportunistic event-driven credit firm focused on generating absolute returns across the credit cycle that integrates material ESG risk factors throughout the investment process. So Paul has been working in sustainability and corporate res responsibility for more than 15 years, both on the investment management side and within companies and, and enterprises. And before that, she was responsible for strategic health partnerships at Pfizer, where she was instrumental in, in, in helping set up uh, PQMD. So uh, th those are our two expert guests. And, and I, 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 I want to start by focusing on ESG and health. So clearly ESG, a vast topic, a slightly less vast topic in health. Um, and, and let me ask you, first of all, Paula, is it just about access and pricing at home and overseas, or, or is it broader than that? Yeah, well, thank, first of all, thanks so much, Mark uh, and PQMD for having me. I feel like this is a homecoming of sorts and it's uh, great to see so many names that I recognize in the chat. Um, look, you know, ESG suffers a bit from a Rosh the Rashomon effect. I don't know if those of you are familiar with the Kurosawa movie, but it's basically the story of a detective who's trying to get to the bottom of a murder interviewing witnesses. And as you go through the, the witness list, it's pretty clear that we're not even sure that people saw the same event. And that, that is what I think ESG is. It started with the Quakers and exclusions and it's grown since. And I think, um, you know, each investor defines it slightly differently. So I can talk a little bit about what we look at. We're not just looking at risk, but we're looking at opportunity. We are um, a credit investor. So we are particularly interested in drivers of your cost of capital. Um, in particular, uh, and, and your valuation. And we're gonna look at uh, not just access or quality, um, but we're gonna look at, you know, what is SASB? And those of you who are not familiar with SASB, it is a sort of an international reporting framework that is geared towards investors that looks at financially material factors. We're gonna look at those, but we look very deeply at what your companies say about themselves. Where do we find that? Well, if you produce a sustainability report, and a lot of the companies in our universe don't, we're going to look there. We're going to look at your SEC filings, right? Your 10K, your proxy. What do you say about yourselves? What do you say your risks are? Um, I would argue that in, in uh, you know, biopharmaceuticals, uh, there are several, including talent. Um, in fact, um, I have probably not read a 10K in the last six years that didn't cite talent as an existential risk, right? Uh, and talent is your lifeblood as a research-based um, uh, or uh, group. And, and those of you colleagues who are from the NGO sector, I mean, talent is absolutely critical as well. So we're looking at a range of factors and then we, we are very engaged investors. We speak with our companies all the time about fundamental issues. They often come to us for uh, advice on debt issuance, um, balance sheet issues, and they come to us for advice on ESG. Um, and so we spend a lot of time talking to them. And what we try to do is just focus on a few things that they've also prioritized and try to help them along the journey. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's a mosaic of factors that we pull together from a variety of sources to do that. Now, not every investor does it the way we do, and I don't know that we have all the answers, but uh, give you a little window into our process. So Veronica, you've just produced a sustainability report. So get a big tick mark for that, obviously, because it sets you apart from others. What, what, what was in it? I mean, I, I accept that Baxter is a little bit different from a typical pharmaceutical company in what you do, but, but tell us what the highlights of that sustainability report were. 
Yeah. Yeah, I would say, um, well, thank you. So first of all, let me just say thank you. I'm really glad to be here. I mean, at Baxter, I wear two hats and I work across sort of the company uh, at the intersection of corporate responsibility and philanthropy. And really the goal is to leverage Baxter's assets and capabilities as we continue to further evolve and enhance our disclosures and our reporting. So obviously our biggest tool is that corporate responsibility report and Baxter you know, has a 30 year history, 31 year history of reporting our environmental performance. So, um, you know, we in 2021 launched our 2030 CR commitment and goals. And, and that's really to support our three overarching um, commitments, which are to empower our patients, protect our planet and champion our people and communities. So, you know, notably we look at our goals and say, you know, we're looking to achieve carbon neutrality in our direct operations by 2040 um, and obviously reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions by 2030. We have measurable goals that will increase the representation of women and global leadership and ethnic minorities in US leadership roles for 2030. We're providing you know, far more granular demographic data than we have in the past in, 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 much, in much of the areas and across the E, the S and the G sort of um, landscape and horizon. We also aligned with you know, our goals with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, you know, an, a framework by which we can sort of tell our story. Um, so, you know, I think for us as it relates to ESG and sort of the momentum, we look at our corporate responsibility tool as one way to tell our story, to report performance against our, you know, our 10 bold goals and to really sort of under, help people understand our overarching commitments to, you know, patients, planet and people and communities. So, you know, as we think about ESG and, you know, that story that we tell on an annual basis, um, it's, it's one way in which we can engage with all of our stakeholders and it involves a, you know, it involves a, um, a way to sort of go beyond investors, key stakeholders, and really we, what we're trying to be is more transparent and, you, and, and provide more actionable information. And that's for all of our stakeholders, right? I mean, we know that ESG is becoming, you know, a, a business imperative. It's while maybe driven primarily by investors who, in my estimation, are looking to integrate environmental, social, and governance topics into their investing decisions. I mean, for us, this is an endeavor that goes um, throughout the year and is really, you know, managed all the way from the board of directors to, you know, to our executive corporate responsibility committee, to our CR council internally, you know, to then the, 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 the actual publication of that report. Um, so it really does contain a wealth of information regarding that, that, landscape, that landscape and horizon and how we tell our story who the audiences are that we're trying to make sure that we accommodate with our data um, and you know, to make sure that we're tracking you know, globally uh, on our goals across our enterprise. Does that help or would you like a little bit more context? It helps a lot. Um, it helps a lot. And you mentioned patients, planet and people. If there are, if there are um, participants in the audience, and I can see we've got a very good mix of people from NGOs and industry. So if there are people in the audience who want to slightly tweak that and say that's, that's not our ESG framework, feel free, use the chat and we'll, we'll include it. Um, Veronica, you know, what you've outlined there is a very comprehensive internal process. Mm -hmm. So you're validating this in lots of different ways internally, lots of different internal audiences. Increasingly, though, that kind of voluntary reporting is not enough, right? You have to fit governmental frameworks too. The European Union has a directive. The, the, the SEC may be coming out with new regulations. Tell us a bit about that. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Paula to tell us a bit about what investor, because you mentioned investor reporting. So I'm going to ask a little bit about investor frameworks in a second. Sure, sure. Happy to. So, you know, I think um, the question of, of ESG and sort of like, I know that we sort of started and kicked off with this idea of what is ESG. So I think, you know, to me, it's far more comprehensive than climate action, access and pricing. I mean, I think given any sector, um, it's about good governance of, you know, the environmental, social and governance topics that are material to that industry. So I think one of the things I would say is that no matter where, you know, where a company is on its journey, every company should really assess what's material to their business, why their companies, you know, what they what their companies might consider most vital, vital to business success and business resilience. So I think, you know, ESG is about driving good governance um, to a company's ESG material topics. And so as I look at, you know, how do we understand the three pillars? You know, it's really about, you know, how those things together affect and shape strategies, business model, 
more, you know, more business resilient. So as we look at that in terms of the landscape of the EU and the corporate sustainability reporting directive, as we look at that in terms of SEC, you know, regulations and environment, I think what we're doing is somewhat moving from, from a landscape where, you know, corporate responsibility has typically been, um, you know, it's been a, a, a critical piece of how we tell our story. It's been, you know, from, you know, it's been voluntarily published um, on a on an annual basis by, you know, several companies to talk about corporate responsibility, ESG or impact reporting, and to either share how they're how they're tracking against pre-established goals, or they're sharing strategically how they're incorporating corporate responsibility or sustainability ESG into their business model. So the landscape is shifting, and what, what we're seeing is that more and more there are regulatory bodies, um, there are agencies, there are rating rankings and surveys agencies that are really looking to attempt to define, regulate, and or mandate reporting. And it's really hard to navigate the reporting and disclosure landscape at the moment. Um, you know, more and more requirements means more and more resources for companies to sort of figure out how best to disclose this information, but that landscape is growing. You know, I, I mean, I can sort of name a few of them if, that, if that's of interest, but you no know, corporate responsibility, the EU corporate sustainability reporting directive, there's the, the EU corporate responsibility of corporate sustainability, triple D, the due diligence um, process. There's the taxonomy in terms of how we're, you know, organizing the ESG principles and thoughts around the work that we're doing. Um, you know, there's a the SEC and there's a pending regulation in the US, which will likely will come what will come uh, literally after the EU um, reporting. And there's there's you know there's a planned phase of how we start to report this information. But I, I think I heard you once, um, Paula, say that it's over 1,200 uh, indicators and, and points for, around for, that. For the CSRD, yeah. Yeah, for the CSRD. So, you know, more and more what we're seeing is voluntary reporting um, is moving potentially to a place where it might be more mandatory and, or more required. Um, and so that landscape, as it shifts, is, is really sort of putting pressure, if you will, on many of the companies and likely the investors of the community as well um, to, to report out on so much of the information and data that the data points that they're seeking. So maybe, Paula, over to you, because I think you might be looking at this from the investor perspective. Have I you mean, I, I, I sort of have both because I was you guys in a past life. Um, and you know, I, I think I'm all for more transparency and more information. I mean, I think people who are making investment decisions, purchasing decisions, whatever, you know, they need more information. But I think we're at a point now where it's information for information's sake. And I think we have to step, take a step back and say, why are we asking for these data points? And what do they tell us? What, what is the purpose? Um, uh, and, and that you know, sadly, I think we've lost the thread. The purpose of the exercise is not a sustainability report. The purpose of the exercise is a resilient business, right? I want to know that your business is going to be there and be relevant, managing risks, mining opportunities that present themselves in the 21st century, you know, in five years, 10 years, 20 years, right? Um, and I think we've done, you know, there's sort of this whole industry that's risen up around ESG. It's reporting, it's auditing, it's, you know, data, all right? And, and it's this big business now that uh, is not necessarily serving anyone well. And I think governments have stepped in, you know, well-intentioned on the regulatory side, but none of it, as you pointed out, Veronica, is, is matching up. The SEC requirements are going to be largely EEO1 data, which companies already disclose, and some carbon data, right? Some climate data. The Europeans are, are going to be requiring almost 1,200 data points of 50,000 companies, okay? So you could be a small company, um, but if you have 43 million euros in turnover or something like that, and a certain number and, of employees, you're now scope of the I, SRD. I think, I think it's 250 employees, right? I think it's, I think it is, uh, but it's like something like 43 million euros in turnover. That's very tiny. Um, and what I'm concerned about is companies are spending lots of resources reporting when the time, you know, that sustainability team really needs to be spending time with their operational colleagues, integrating these practices into how the company operates, right? Um, and being that important interpreter between external stakeholders and internal stakeholders. That 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 I have a huge a huge concern about. Um, and so I'm sure a lot of the corporate colleagues on this call share that concern. We we've actually got a couple of questions. One of them for I'm oh, going to come to a geo question in a minute, but one from one of your corporate colleagues, 
uh, for, from Jennifer Kim Field at Henry Schein, who, who, who says this, um, given the term as ESG is viewed so differently by various stakeholders, it, are we seeing shifts in how the term is or isn't used? And do companies use that? This is a really interesting question. Do companies use different terms internally to the ones they use externally? I mean, that's possible. I, look, I think that um, the the lack of decent definition of ESG and what we are actually, you know, in a agree, lack of sort of agreed definition of what we're talking about has certainly helped fuel the current ESG backlash, right? I mean, I never thought I would live in a world where um, you know, a hedge fund like ours was considered woke, but here we are. Um, and, and so I think, you know, we need to, it, on the investor side, I think we need to be really clear about what ESG is. ESG is not a style of investing. It is a set of factors that investors feel are material to a company's valuation and performance, right? Um, and can drive out performance over time in an investment. Um, it is, it is not, well, capitalism, it is not a style of investing. It is a really valuable analytical tool that our analysts use as they're looking at your company. They're gonna look at your financials and they're gonna also look at these other factors to get a good picture of the quality of management, how you're executing on strategy, um, you know, what you're focusing on, what the risks are and what the opportunities are um, beyond just what is a balance sheet would show us, right? Or a financial review would show us. That is to us what ESG is. Um, in companies, I think companies used to, when we, I, it went, you know, it used to be called way back in the day, corporate social responsibility, then it was sustainability. Um, they used a variety of terms, um, but I think, you know, it's, and now companies are also starting to call people ESG officers. Um, and that's, that's, I think, a little bit of a misnomer, but that's my personal opinion. But, but as I said, and, and, and those of you who are in corporates now know that you are, you know, handling multiple competing, um, you know, priorities that um, you have roles that are extremely complex. Um, and um, often you're the only person in your institution that does that role. Um, and um, you know, so I don't know, but maybe Veronica, you can give a better update on sort of the state of play and, in corporate. And Veronica, could you talk about how to, to, to the other the other part of Jennifer's question, how it's changed over time? Because you I mean, you've both been doing this for a while, but but what you've seen Baxter, I suppose, was a very early mover here. So you may have seen the changes mm -hmm. more acutely than than others. Yeah, uh, so I would say, you know, my, my general sense is that the investors and corporate interests uh, ESG remains strong. So I, I don't think I'm alone in thinking that while there's been an emergence of sort of an anti-ESG movement, mostly in the U.S. as I understand it, I think the foundations of ESG as a concept and as a tool, although perhaps not the term itself, are sound, right? I think the tenets of corporate responsibility and ESG are important to Baxter's long-term success. I'll just, you know, as an example, I think investors and companies are using a blended approach to corporate responsibility and ESG. I think you know, as a reporting and disclosure tool, it's to increase transparency, to, you know, um, make the business case for your greater business resilience. I do think, you know, that it, it moves the company forward in, in looking at the ways that it can innovate to, you know, its business and, you know, um, manage against some of maybe material risks. I think investors are looking for progress, not perfection. I mean, I think I will just say yeah. that maybe repeat it. Investors are looking for progress, not perfection. We're, think, we're looking you know, to make sure you manage your risks and you understand the opportunities. Yeah. Um, and, per, you know, no one's perfect. Yeah. We're not perfect. And uh, ESG is lots of shades of gray. Yeah, uh, exactly. exactly. So I, I, I want to come back to this question of measuring the value in a second. Did, did you want to add something, Veronica? Well, I would just, I would, the only thing, other thing I would say is that, you know, I think to me, I think again, this 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 blended approach to CRESG, you know, is a better it's better transparency around governance. I mean, for me, from a reporting and disclosure perspective, I think ESG, the reporting frameworks are useful. I just don't want so many of them, right? I would like to see some more integration around, you know, how we do this. Um, you know, whether it's SASB, this you know the sustainability accounting. Um, stakeholder um, board group, rather, right? or, you know, TCFD, the task force on, you know, crime and related financial disclosures. I mean, I think to me, 
Um, you know, it's it's about building trust and meeting stakeholder meeting stakeholder expectations. It's about regulatory compliance. It's managing risk and opportunity, standardizing the information, you know, and how we report it is one place I'd like us to move towards. It provides a competitive edge. I mean, I think there's some, something to be said in terms of how you approach it might be a differentiator and it can give you, you know, it can demonstrate your commitment and then, you know, access to capital more and more. I think it's being tied to, you know, how we access capital and, and how we're rated might determine how we access that capital. So, I mean, I, I put that all out there to say, you know, whether or not the term is right for you as a company, I think is, a, is an individual decision. We've chosen to stick the route of corporate responsibility. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, you know, what we're looking to do is really build business resilience. Um, and, you know, how we go about that and sort of the, 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 the and how we term it might be different. It's really, I had a client in the Midwest who, who I said, how do you define ESG? To which her response was, I define it as anything that makes the Gen Zers want to work for us, not Google, which I thought was that. That's part of it. That's part of it. <laughs> it's definitely yeah. part of it. But you know, to me, it's really about um, how you operate, not how you talk about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting about this particular industry is, you know, when you talked about SDG alignment, Veronica, you are squarely in the sort of healthcare SDG, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, whatever people think about the pharmaceutical industry, you can not like their pricing, you can not like their patent protection, you can not like a lot of things. But at the end of the day, having spent 13 years of my career in the industry, I know that every person in my company woke up every day and came to work to make to improve human health, whether they worked in the mailroom or the boardroom or the lab. Everyone had that sense of purpose. And there are very few industries where you actually see that uh, come through as part of the business model. And it's a huge competitive advantage, I think, for the industry. If, if we communicate it right. I want to, I want to come you, back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I want to come back to this issue of, of value and measurement in a second. But um, I want to make sure that I ask Simone Jones's question from Mercy Ships. Now, uh, and I think this is a question that a lot of people uh, in, in taking part today will want to know. So she says NGOs, nonprofit organizations, so civil society more broadly, have great reporting on the S of ESG, ESG but often lack information on the E and the G. Uh, and, and so she says, what can we do to better support corporate partners with their ESG goals? And, I, and I, I'm reading into that, which Simone may not have meant me to, but reading into that, is it more likely that there will be corporate partners if NGOs are good at reporting on all three parts of it? Um, Veronica, let me start with you, because obviously this is something you deal with a lot at the foundation, right? Sure, sure, sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, creating ESG or, you know, um, CR ESG success, really, it's about creating value for investors, employees, partners, um, you know, in a range of both internal and external stakeholders. So, um, I think the the piece about future proofing your business and at, whether you're a business or you're a nonprofit, um, it's about helping to improve risk management. I think as I look at, you know, how I think about um, our our work um, and the exercise of um, the partnerships that we create, this really is about telling the S story at some level. Um, and you know, what are we investing in? Why are we investing in it? And it's telling that story. Um, around what we're prioritizing in terms of what we fund, support, um, and how we're trying to look and build impact. I think that's one place and in, in part of it, you know, and I think, you know, how a business treats its human stakeholders, both inside and out, outside the corporation, I think is another big part of it. Um, and that, you know, that sort of extends far beyond. It's, it's you know, not only the partnerships, but it's living wages, diversity, inclusion, gender, you know, um, gender pay gaps, employee engagement, um, rethinking, you know, training, human rights, charity. And I think, you know, this, these are all, you know, health and safety. So as I, as I think about the S piece of this, I think that's one part of the story. I think the E piece, I mean, I think there's a place um, for, for conversations around, you know, partnerships. I mean, I, I, I hear the concern that companies have, well, you know, will we have, you know, prioritizing CRESG reporting um, and the mounting resources it'll take to, to accomplish that, you know, um, it, will that impact the giving? I, I don't think it'll come at the cost of a trade-off. Can it happen? Certainly, but I, I think that won't be the norm. 
Um, I think that investing in communities is a tenet of ESG as the model. Um, social investing is part of that core. And admittedly, I think more and more my my team, well, you know, more and more of my team's time is being spent or consumed by the CR work and the reporting. And um, I think that it takes, you know, I think that it takes the partnerships, I think are going to be unique in emerging from this ESG momentum. I mean, I think that for me, the social investing front, I think there are new ways of giving that will continually evolve. And, and, and I think that will, you know, will continue to move from giving to investment, like on the environmental front. And I've been trying to think about this from a, from a nonprofit perspective. I think companies, you know, as we start to think about how we measure scope three and how that extends to how our vendors and suppliers measure their emissions. I mean, the NGOs are a part of that equation, right? At some level, you know, many of our NGOs are suppliers, right? You have supply, you have a supply chain, you have complex logistics systems, you transport, you know, our goods, um, our products, our donations, and you deliver those products and services across the globe. So, you know, none of us, in my view, are immune to making ESG commitments. So I think the partnerships will be vital to how we tackle climate action, for example. And I, again, using that as just an example. Um, I don't know, Paula, is there, some, is there something on your mind that you might want to add? Yeah, I mean, like the S is, is so difficult because it varies. I mean, from the, the investor perch, you know, the S factors vary from industry to industry. What is material and important in the social space in Healthcare is very different from oil and gas, right? Um, and so the question is, what can we glean from, uh, we, we don't, I mean, we look at your philanthropy, but we don't consider it financially material, right? It's not gonna impact the performance of the security. That said, it says a lot to us about the culture of the enterprise, uh, the quality of management, uh, how responsive you are to stakeholders uh, is, is an important data point and who you are working with who you surround yourselves with, also an important sort of data point in understanding sort of the culture and the purpose of the organization. But, but um, it, may, so, it, it may also be that an NGO is more likely to become your partner if they're giving you data in a format where you find it easy to use than if you're, yeah, absolutely. Okay, and, and, you know, there are NGOs whose data we look at. Um, it may not be the colleagues on the phone today, on the call today, but you know, for example, if I'm looking at someone's supply chain issues, I'm going to look deeply at know the chain, right? If I uh, am looking at uh, anti-corruption, uh, I'm going to look at Transparency International, right? Deeply, uh, uh, Oxfam and others. I don't know if any of those folks are on the a call today, but um, you know, we're going to look at those because they have important data. To your point, Mark, um, that we think is uh, valuable. To the process. So Jennifer uh, Kim Field from Henry Shan has added a, an interesting thought here, which is in the chat if you want to see it in full. Uh, but 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 she says, how can we all work together to track the same outputs, inputs, and health outcomes? And there isn't a standard right now. I'm going to come back to this in a second. So there are, there are all these different consortiums out there that continue to to ask for different things. And she says this could be an interesting continued conversation among the PQMD members. And I think it could. I mean, I can see this continuing on the, the COP, on the community of practice. But I, I can also see this being an opportunity for PQMD to help structure this a little bit. On a related topic, actually, Cara McCarthy from SC Johnson says, uh, sort of related to Jennifer's point about no established standard, um, says it's the Wild West uh, right now. How do you guide your teams and your partners, so both internally and externally, on what is valuable to report other than what you have to report? So there's, there's the 1,200 points, but what else do we guide them on? Yeah. So in I'll terms of our portfolio companies, um, we, we tell them to use sustainability reporting as a business tool. That's what it should be first and foremost, including a disclosure tool. And so they should focus on things that matter to their business. Um, we tend to work with smaller companies, and so they are very resource constrained uh, and cannot do a 200 page sustainability report across 70 or 200 or 1000 sort of data points. And so we, we, we try to focus them on, on that, on, on keeping this as a practical tool. Um, again, the point of the exercise is to strengthen your business, as, as you know, Veronica said earlier, um, the disclosure is important. It is, a, it is the Wild West. Of it. I mean, I think we're way too focused on process metrics that I'm not sure what they tell us, but we're going to all be disclosing 1,500 of them pretty soon. 
um, as opposed to outcome metrics. And I do think that's a huge role for PQMD to play. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to say, you know, we emitted X metric tons of carbon and we set a net zero goal, or we, you know, delivered X, you know, doses of vaccine to Y country. It's, it's much harder to be able to say, we move the needle on a particular issue and this is how we did it. I, I want to draw everybody's attention to an interesting discussion that I'm not going to read out, but in the chat between Ellen Rafferty of BD and uh, Simone at Mercy Ships on, on, on exactly this point. I won't, because we're short of time, I won't read it out, but it's ex exactly yeah. about how you, 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 you talk about uh, your impact. Let, let me come back a little bit to this question of measuring, because we, we've been going all, of, all, all around it um, uh, here. The question though, how much of it's actually verified? I mean, what's to stop? If Veronica weren't such a nice and honest person, What's to stop her saying, I've got a sustainability report, I'll write it next weekend at home, stick in something that looks good and Paula will be happy. <laughs> well, Veronica wouldn't do that, but... Yeah. Uh, no, I have a... Uh, but <laughs> if, if there were a bad Veronica in the world... That's <laughs> well, listen, I think, you know, good governance, I think at the end of the day, we're all going... I go back to the good governance. Is, it's, it's really of the company's ability to produce high quality, accurate, reliable information. You know, and I think as a part of that good governance, I mean, you know, currently, again, most companies, you know, voluntarily publish a corporate responsibility report to really sort of talk through, you know, how they're integrating corporate responsibility, ESG, sustainability, you know, into their business model. And I think, you know, we publish, and I'll give you the example at Baxter, right? We publish an annual corporate responsibility report where we track our performance against our 2030, you know, CR goals, which we established in 2021. Um, we externally assure most of our environmental data and then internally um, assure the data that is not externally assured. Um, we reference the GRI index. Additionally, I think we report annually using the SASB disclosure index. Again, we have that reviewed um, by our internal controls team. We have the sustainability accounting board, um, standards board, the SASB index. And we're, you know, looking to publish the, the TCFD this year. So, you know, we have a process of governance. We also have that legally reviewed. Um, the entire report is, legal, is reviewed by our legal team, um, select legal team members. Um, and so it goes through a process and rounds of internal review um, and assurance. And then we have external assurance of environmental data. So I think this is the, the trend. I, I see more and more companies moving towards internal assurance, or at least using their internal controls teams to assure their data, likely, um, you know, as we move into the future. And in the in, I think we're all going to likely move into a, a world where we're going to need external assurance uh, of this data. Um, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not going to be as far off as I'd like it to be. Um, but I do think that we're all doing the best that we can to assure our data, whether internally and externally, um, and align with the frameworks that make the most sense and that are more material to the companies that we work with. Right. Okay. And using materiality in a non-financial, um, 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 perspective. Paula, is that the standard you see, uh, uh, among the companies you're, you're watching? Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing much more involvement of the CFO. And I think, you know, to Veronica's point, that's a sign of the regulatory shifts that are afoot. Um, you know, the SEC climate change rule and to much anticipated, um, you know, means that that data is going to be part of the 10K. Uh, and that is very different from, uh, you know, back in the day when we would all produce our voluntary reports and the board would be like, that's awesome. Thanks so much. See you next year. Right. So this, th this is very different. Um, look, investors make decisions, you know, um, and use information that's imperfect all the time. It may not be a perfect disclosure. It may not be verified. Uh, we are seeing more and more external verification, but, you know, some data uh, and a conversation with management is better than no data. Um, and you have to make a judgment call. So uh, I'm less concerned about that. I'm more concerned about the burden on companies, particularly smaller companies going forward of these competing sort of uh, disclosure requirements um, and um, multiple stakeholders. I, I speak with our companies all the time and one of their biggest complaints is multiple investors, multiple stakeholders asking for the same data cut every which way to Sunday. They want their own bespoke reporting. Your sustainability report isn't good enough. Um, and then we can talk about the ESG data providers, uh, perhaps if someone gives me a drink, but um, it's, you know, it's, problematic. It's like, it is the Wild West. I saw in the chat someone calling this the Wild West. That's where we are. 
it's important to note though, you know, when, you know, financial reporting is probably only about 80 or 90 years old. And that was the wild west, you know, back in the day before the great depression, companies didn't have to disclose anything. So it's a process. It's going to take time. It's going to be really, really messy for the next few years, but hopefully we'll land in a place that's useful for stakeholders, uh, including investors um, and the companies um, that have to generate this information. Although I'm sure lots of NGOs are listening, thinking, yeah, and donor reporting has been the Wild West since- Oh, God. Exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. and has never got any better. So no, don't, don't be too optimistic. <laughs> that's um, true. We've had multiple initiatives and absolutely no harmonization. Anyway, um, Paula, you mentioned, you know, you've mentioned several times now, you, you look at this, you, you, you make calls about credit in your case. Yeah. But do you think investors are looking at ESG as something that's an artificial market? Baxter does really well on ESG. At the moment, ESG is trendy and in vogue. That means Baxter stock is worth more. At some point, ESG may cease to be trendy at which point that added value to Baxter stock will disappear. Is that option one? Option two is this is actually a marker. And I, I think Veronica suggested this earlier. This is actually a marker for how well a company is preparing for a future in which environmental challenges and indeed social challenges will, will grow. I mean, which of those two do you think is, or maybe it's not either of them, yeah, I actually think it's more the second option. Look, you know, uh, I think I read a, um, an estimate in Bloomberg that pretty soon roughly one third of all assets under professional management will be managed under an ESG label, which, as we already discussed, is a very broad moniker. <clears throat> that said, um, you know, investors have always looked at these factors and I've, it should be called GES or GSE, not ESG, because we have always looked at the quality of the board. Uh, the board oversight, the quality of management. Um, we look very closely at what is your, what are your executives paid to do? Are they paid to juice returns every quarter? Or are they paid to deliver on long-term value creation? We look for ESG. You know, if ESG is so important to your enterprise, then I want to see metrics in your executive compensation. I want to, you know, because I know that if senior executives aren't, you know, paid to do something, they've got very complex jobs. They're not going to do it, right? And so that's something we look at, but ESG is not a flash in the pan. It is a very powerful tool to understand um, company, company, uh, how companies operate and how they create value. And you know, investors have fiduciary responsibilities, right? They have a responsibility to their investors. We have investors who are pension funds who have you have to pay, you know, firefighter and 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 uh, police and teacher pensions not tomorrow. 20, 30, 40 years from now. So we, we take that responsibility very seriously. And we believe that there are factors, uh, uh, you know, that we are now calling ESG that are going to matter to whether, you know, to the future of your enterprise, to its longevity, to its profitability, and our ability to generate returns for people who rely on us to do so. So uh, at the risk of driving Veronica to drink as well, uh, <laughs> People who are not working in this ESG field will have may have heard talk about scope one, scope two, and scope three. You haven't, you haven't, you're breathing deeply. It's fine. Tell us what scope one, scope two, and scope three are, and how you have to report on 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 those, because that comes back to that partnership question as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to just jump in and say I think I would say broadly defined, you know, essentially scope one and two are the emissions that are owned or controlled by our company. So those are the sort of direct um, operational scope one. So it's, we own a vehicle, the emissions that might be coming from that vehicle we own or you know, a corporate jet or a manufacturing site. Those are the emissions that as a company, scope one and scope two really are uh, more about the, the ones that are, that are direct. I would say scope three, and you know, again, I'm not a scientist or a technician, so I'm probably doing this a very sort of very broad high level. I think the indirect, right? It's like you know, if we contract a tra you know a plane to um, fly, if we contract a bus um, or a vehicle, if we contract a ship to ship our goods across the sea, um, it's it's what we use our suppliers and vendors, right? In terms of you know to to help operate our business or advance our business. So I think broadly one and two are what the company, um, you know, emissions are owned or controlled by company. And then three is those that are indirect because of the contracted services. So that that gives 
sort of a maybe a baseline. I don't know if you want to expand on that, Paula. Just a lot of the colleagues on this call who are NGOs are part of your scope three emissions, right? That's they're right. They're they're you know handling the transport um, of um, medicines to um, the end destination, and so that factors into your scope three. You know, right now, with the exception of net zero target setting, most companies are not don't have a full grasp on their scope three emissions. Um, um, it, that's improving; they're calculating more and more of them. Um, but um, you know, companies tend to focus on what they can control directly. Scope three, you can perhaps influence. Um, but scope one and two are really where you guys can control more directly. And, and clearly, as a donor, you can potentially have a bigger influence on scope three. So, um, Veronica, you're, you're, here's, a here's a really tough question for you. From, well, good question, though, from mm -hmm. Melissa Wu at Seeding Labs. So mm -hmm. she says that pharma partners tend to have more of an emphasis on the S, while device partners have more of an emphasis on the E. Have, have you seen that trend, the trend she's seen with her partners? Mm -hmm. And if so, what's the path for more emphasis on S with device companies? I haven't seen, I've worked both pharma and now medical device. I mean, I, I would not necessarily say that I've seen a major difference in terms of our approach. I mean, I think, you know, at least taking it from a philanthropic standpoint, I mean, I think, listen, as a, depending on your organization, corporate or nonprofit, I think ESG commitments are really an opportunity to sort of improve business model and health service delivery. So I think, you know, as I look at that from a from a from an E or an S, um, I think we have opportunities, right, um, to continue to tackle the, the ESG opportunities at, um, at the at the forefront. I mean, I think if you're, you know, if you're a if you're a nonprofit, I'm not sure. I mean, I I don't see this as, as necessarily our dynamic. I think in in either case and in either opportunity, I think the opportunity is innovation. So as, as you look at whether you're focusing in on you know ESG from an E or or from an S perspective, I think the opportunity with much of our partnerships is really to build innovation in those partnerships to figure out how best um, to bring it back to you know what's advancing the business, what's advancing the partnership, what's advancing the NGO. Um, and I think there's opportunities, especially as we look at product donations versus cash, you know, are there opportunities to innovate in the space where medical devices might be, you know, um, delivered to, to locations, geographies, or um, places where they may be able to advance health in a particular way? way. So I think we have probably more, you know, more of an opportunity to do that from a product donations and cash standpoint. Um, but I don't know that I would distinguish between, you know, medical device and pharma. Great. In general, I think the sector isn't hugely emitting from a scope one, scope two perspective compared to oil and gas or metals and mining or manufacturing. And I mean, like uh, materials uh, kinds of companies, industrials. And so that's you know i think i've seen more focus on the s aspects um than than the e but 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 presumably the nature of devices is there'd be a a, a bit more scope one and two emissions associated Maybe. with the i don't know um, a really interesting so um oyatola odu yemi uh has made a point about the frameworks really sort of echoing what you say and i would encourage people to have a a look at that in the chat there, because um, uh, I, I think the point she makes, which is interesting, is that each of the framework focuses on different aspects of ESG. So the harmonization may not be as simple as we we thought about. Does does Oyatola's, Oyatola's point sound right you know, to you? This is why a materiality assessment conducted by the company is so critical. At the end of the day, it's the company that has to decide what drives their business uh, and what matters to their stakeholders. They need to prioritize their stakeholders and the, and the issues they face and focus on the ones that are the most important, right? That upper kind of right-hand quadrant of the Boston Square. And I think we all need to, you know, sadly, you know, every framework has its advocates, right? But I think at the end of the day, figure out what matters and how you're going to measure and report on that as opposed to being wedded to a particular framework. Yeah. And, and for people who aren't familiar with it, materiality assessment is a systematic process of right. asking your stakeholders which issues matter to them. That's um, right. So Chris Nile, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, says he's come across an increasing use of the term purpose, cutting across CSR, diversity, equity and inclusion, environment, ESG, sustainability. Do we do we see purpose becoming the new 
the new framework? I see Veronica smiling. I, I would say it might be the new term of art. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, whether or not, you know, purpose for any company, again, going back to the materiality assessment piece, I think purpose is defined by what you consider material, what you consider most important um, to advance your business, to grow a resilient business, to grow, you know, to future proof your business and to, you know, try to look at ways to sustainably operate your business. So to me, those are, I think, the factors that sort of underpin purpose. Um, and so, you know, how you give, how you engage with the community, how you protect your planet, how you, you know, how you look in the case of healthcare, how you how you look to advance, either improve health outcomes, increase access, um, and or, you know, empower your patients. Um, those are the ways I think that purpose sort of come to life. So, again, to me, it, it's, it could be a framework that sort of defines what those, e, you know, the E, the S, and the G uh, might be. It could be the materiality, the materiality assessment defines that for you, and you can call that purpose, but I see it more of a term of art than necessarily a framework. I, I agree, and I think it's also a reflection of a huge sea change we've seen. I mean, you know, and I think it was in 1970, Milton Friedman penned a very seminal piece in the New York Times Magazine that the purpose of business is basically generating profits and obeying the law, right? And returning value to shareholders. I think we can all agree that um, society has evolved since then and corporations like any institution are a reflection of society. And I think, you know, co corporations and their stakeholders realize that we are moving to a, um, more of a stakeholder capitalism model uh, that you know, investors are an important stakeholder, but we are not the only stakeholder by any stretch of the imagination that employees, um, you know, business partners, NGOs, communities, customers are all terribly important to the equation and that makes up purpose. Um, and that's that's kind of why we're, we're seeing that. And frankly, uh, companies now know if they want Gen Z to work for them, uh, they, they have to really, have a culture that centers around purpose, uh, or they're not going to be able to be successful in the competition for talent. Yeah. And in a human capital intensive industry like this one, that matters a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey. yeah. I mean, I think I would just add that I, I think the rising social consciousness of consumers, donors, recipients, employees, and the war for talent, the realities of climate change are creating an expectation for greater transparencies, bigger partnerships, innovative thinking and, you know, really, you know, defining how you're going to, you know, address whether that's ESG or purpose, you know, or corporate right. responsibility. Again, I think how you call it, but to me, I think that the, the, the reality is that that greater, that creating that greater expectation um, is about greater transparency and it's about creating the partnerships that will help advance them. Yeah. Um, and and I, I have another client who I obviously won't name, who said, yes, we have to pay a purpose premium. So I said, meaning? Uh, and, and, and she said, well, meaning our purpose isn't evident, so we have to pay a premium to get people to work for us, which I thought was wow. a, an interesting reflection on corporate wow. culture. <laughs> and an opportunity, I would say, to define it better um, and to create a cohesive narrative around the work that you're doing. Because I think most companies are doing it. They may not have the, the, the narrative to, That's to right. tell their story. But, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, I think it's a great opportunity. Or, 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 as Paula said, it may not be built into the incentive structure of the company. Before we wrap up, because we, we are going to run out of time, I, I want to talk. I've, I've been looking at our little checklist of things we wanted to cover. And I think if you both agree, we've covered most of them. The thing we haven't talked about to me on our list is why there's a backlash. So we, we've spent 50 minutes talking. It all sounds great. We're, we're creating shareholder value. Potentially, we're lowering the wage bill by making it a more appealing place to work. We're, we're setting out markers for future sustainability. We've done all of that. So why is there a backlash? Why are so many and, and how many companies are going into hiding? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you know, I, I, backlash is uh, basically a U.S. phenomenon, and I think it's a reflection of the divisive um, society in which we find ourselves. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot written on it, so I don't think that I can add much more. Um, I think part of it is that um, on the investment side in particular, there's a wide variety of investment products that are labeled ESG out there, many of which are not um, 
they're not particularly sophisticated. They'll game the third party scores, um, which are flawed. Um, and I know we don't have time to talk about that, but they are flawed and stale. Uh, and then they'll make up their own score and they'll call a fund ESG. And that, that to me is not getting at the heart of the matter. Your score reflects your disclosure. And there are a lot of good companies out there that don't disclose or don't have 10 people who can write a report um, who are doing really good work as part of how they operate and they don't, they don't have the narrative. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, and I think um, as a community, both of corporate practitioners and investors, we have let others define the work and we need to you know, come out and say, okay, this is what it means to us and this is why it's important. This is why it adds value um, and sort of break free from the label. I mean, BlackRock, I understand, they're, you know, they're no longer calling it ESG investing. They're calling it transition something or other. I mean, let, you know, changing the label is not going to help. We, we actually need to articulate what it is we're doing and why and why it creates value for all of our stakeholders. And we haven't done that very well. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I'll go back to a point that I made earlier, which is I think investors in corporate um, and corporate and, you know, corporate um, investor, investors and corporate companies are really, I think ESG remains strong. I mean, as I think as a, as a concept, it's sound, right? I mean, I think it's how we tell our story around the things that we're doing that make a difference and make an impact, you know, again, to all stakeholders, shareholders, employees, and, and the community. It's, it's, it's tell, the tenets of corporate responsibility are important, I think, to long-term success, to future-proofing, to building, you know, the business resilience um, that's needed to take our companies forward to act and and to really think through you know what is our climate action plan um i think you know again that going back to that blended approach to you know again no matter what you call it um <clears throat> i think is is really i think uh, uh enhancing our space um i think there's a, a backlash on the term there's a backlash on sort of you know the, the bipartisan way in which it might be looked at, again, from a US, I think mostly um, perspective, but I, I think the tenant is strong. I think the concepts are strong. I think the companies are not gonna stop reporting, start, you know, stop doing, you know, a corporate responsibility reports, stop telling their story. You know, the term of art that they may use to tell that story may change and evolve, but corporate responsibility is sort of, you know, broadly, um, you know, or corporate citizenship, if you wanna go back to the early nineties, um, remain strong as a concept because I think our companies are trying to figure out, I mean, you know, I'll speak from a company perspective, all of our companies are trying to figure out how to do better and, and more um, to address the challenges ahead and they're big, right? And so, you know, whether or not the, the term makes sense now um, or evolves, I think is, is separate to the work that we're doing. And frankly, I don't want it to be a detraction to the work that's being done, right? The work that's being done, the energy, the resources that are being put forth by all companies, I think by several companies um, to, to advance this work and to try and try and make a difference shouldn't be lost in the debate. So Black so BlackRock might have a might might be onto something in changing the term. But yes, it, I, it, your point's taken. Changing uh, the term doesn't change what you're trying to do. This is about no. building resilient enterprises. That's right. Um, that add that create social and economic value for decades to come. Yeah. Uh, and we can call it whatever we want, but that is what Veronica and her team and, and colleagues on this call do every day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important work. Absolutely. And that, that's the core of it. In the chat here, I think we've got the start of a lot of conversations that I hope will continue on the community practice, including a point from EJ, which we haven't had time to address here, but I, I mean, it's, got, it's a massive topic, which mm -hmm. is how do we collect all of this information and let it inform policy uh, and, and let it uh, make sure that it, it directs how human financial and technical resources are invested. So that is not a question I will ask you to address in 30 seconds, but it is clearly an important one yeah. that, we need to, uh, that we need to get to in the, um, in the um, community of practice and in subsequent discussions. So I would really encourage all of you who are PQMD members to have a look on the community of practice. All of you who are not PQMD members, I think it goes without saying, that you need to click on the application, which is in the chat and become one uh, and subscribe to the PQMD newsletter. Um, I think it only remains for me to thank our very involved audience and to thank Paula and Veronica 
uh, for such a, a, an informative and, and, and interesting and lively hour. So thank you to both of you, really. Thank you, uh, yeah. uh, and thank you PQMD for the opportunity and thank you to the audience. This is, you know, we're all tired of this format during COVID and you were so engaged and your questions were great. So thank you so much. Yeah, wonderful. thank you, what a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Talk more soon, I hope.